Good morning and welcome to this morning's service from church. It's been a fantastic week full of incredible things that have happened. Uh, not the least of which is, of course, uh, we've landed another rover onto Mars uh, in a spectacular feat of engineering and ingenuity. But also from the church's perspective, we've had a fantastic week as we've started our Lent study. And we hope you've been enjoying that and joining in and looking at everything that Heather's been doing each night. Remember that that goes on for the full 15 days, uh, except for Sundays. And we hope that you can continue to join in and take that communion together as we find a way to fellowship together even though we can't meet. As I say, it's been a fantastic week and we just hope that you've all been having a great time and we understand the difficulties of lockdown and things like that, but we hope that you're finding ways that you can connect with God and, and just feel his presence, especially during this time of Lent when you know we take a time to pause and think, who is God? What is our relationship with God and how are we doing with our relationship with God? So we just pray that the daily readings, the daily communion that we're having helps bring a bit of pause into life, bring a bit of connection with God during these times. Let's pray. Father, it really is an incredible time to be alive as we can see all the amazing things that we are able to do with the knowledge and ingenuity that you are giving us. And we just pray, Lord, that you know, those incredible gifts that you've given us are continue to be used for the betterment of man. We thank, Lord, the people who can think these things up, that can think about science and what we can achieve, not the least of which is that we have managed to create vaccines for this horrible COVID disease that we have. And we've managed to create these vaccines, so many different vaccines, in such a short period of time. And that these vaccines give us hope that we can look to the time when we're going to be able to meet together. But in the meantime, Lord, we thank you for all the other technological marvels that enable us to do things like this service online and bring in your word to people, even when we can't meet together physically. Amen. Let's have a great service, and now let's praise God. Yeah. Trust in you, always faithful, and you bring us through. You are greater than anything that comes our way, so we will follow where you lead. We look to you.
So we will look to you. Come on, let's go. You're the God who makes a way when it seems to be no way. You're the one who brings us through. So we will look to you. In our house on Thursday evening, we were all glued to our computer screens as we watched the feed from NASA on YouTube as Perseverance landed on Mars. And we saw those amazing scenes of people celebrating that had worked so hard for that moment. Then we had the first pictures from the surface of the planet. And again, everybody was overjoyed. As I was listening to the broadcast that was happening, uh, somebody, one of the men in mission control said this. He said, we have landed safely on Mars and we even know where we are. And I chuckled to myself inside because I thought that was a, a really funny comment that we even know where we are. They'd managed to navigate across the, the space um, to Mars, but they, they, they were surprised themselves really that they even know, knew where they'd landed on the planet. We even know where we are. It made me think about Jesus in the wilderness. I wonder if he really knew where he was. Did he know where he was when he was in the wilderness or did he find himself in unfamiliar territory? It's interesting to think, isn't it? I bet he had many moments of uncertainty in those 40 days. What was going to happen to him next? What was he going to do with his time? And you know, I'm sure there were moments where he did not really know where he was. Our lives recently have been a little bit like that, haven't they? I guess none of us really know where we are. We've had so much uncertainty uh, with coronavirus, with our jobs, with the children being off school, with homeschooling, and all of the different things that have caused uncertainty in life for everybody of all ages. And you know, life can be like that, can't it? I wonder today if you can safely say that you know where you are, or maybe you're feeling, um, you know, that you're not too sure at the moment where you are. And it is really hard when we feel that way, when we feel like we're in the wilderness. Lent is a good period for us to really reflect on that, that you know, none of us truly all the time know where we are. There are moments in life where things are incredibly uncertain and Lent helps us to take those moments to just focus back in on what God is saying to us. If Jesus felt that way, then it is okay for us today to not entirely know where we are. And that's good news for me because I rarely know where I am or what I'm supposed to be doing. There are many verses in the Bible that reassure us. There's one here from Psalm 145, verse 18. The Lord is close to all who call on him. Yes, to all who call on him in truth. That reminded me of those moments. Uh, I don't know if you've had these when the children are little and you're in a supermarket and they wander off and you watch them wander off but you keep an eye on them. And there's that moment of realization where they think that they are lost and you can see them, but they don't know that you're watching. And it's great, isn't it? Because you know that they're safe because you've got your eye on them, but they panic in that moment. And then it makes them realize that they need to stay near to mom or dad. I, I like this verse because it reminds me of that. You know, when we try and wander away, it's good to know that God still has his eye on us. He is still close to us, even when we're not sure where he is. 
Maybe we feel lost, but God still has eyes on us and he still knows where we are. He's close to all who call on him. The moment he realizes that we think we're lost, he is right there by our side, reassuring us that he knows the way. And it's wonderful, isn't it? In moments where we're not sure, we know that God is. I'm gonna read some verses from Psalm 18, verses 30 to 36. It says, your way is perfect, Lord, and your word is correct. You are a shield for those who run to you for help. You alone are God. Only you are a mighty rock. You give me strength and guide me right. You make my feet run as fast as those of a deer and you help me stand on the mountains. You teach my hands to fight and my arms to use a bow of bronze. You alone are my shield. Your right hand supports me and by coming to help me, you have made me famous. You clear the way for me and now I won't stumble. Those verses help us to remember that God is there with us even when things feel uncertain. He is there to make sure that we don't fall. He is there to help us in those moments. It's interesting, isn't it, that this mission to Mars is called Perseverance. It's interesting, you know, that a little rover now on the planet Mars um, has that job to persevere and to carry on doing what it's been told to do to complete its mission. It's good, isn't it, when we think about that word perseverance, because God wants us to also persevere. He wants us to continue working every day alongside him to fulfill the plans that he has for us. And so when we think about perseverance, you know, no matter whether we feel that we know where we are or whether we feel lost this morning, we know that God wants to help us to get safely through this time. So from Joshua chapter one, verse nine, I've commanded you to be strong and brave. Don't ever be afraid or discouraged. I am the Lord your God, and I will be there to help you wherever you go.
So this morning we're talking about Lent, we're thinking about Lent and we're looking at areas that Christians might typically focus on during Lent. And we're going to look at three areas within the next two weeks. We're going to look at one and a half of them this week and one and a half of them next week. And those areas are confession and surrender and how we focus on that through prayer, reflection and self-control and how we might focus on that through fasting, giving something up, and penance and mourning and how we might think about that through our giving. So if we start with confession and surrender and looking at prayer, if we think about what the Bible says about this area, we can think about 2 Corinthians 9 verse 13, which says this, because of the service by which you have pro proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. 1 John 1 verse 8 says this, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. One of Christianity's central tenets is that we are sinful in nature. And we need to accept that as people, that we are sinful in nature. When Adam ate that apple, when Eve ate that apple, sin entered the world and it entered into our DNA and our biological history. And we have inherited that from our ancestors. And if we can see the world through that lens, it helps us to understand ourselves and it helps us to understand others, the decisions that we make, the actions that we take, and sometimes the cyclical nature of the things that we do, where we think, I'm not going to do this anymore, but we end up doing it. And it's because we are sinful in nature. It also helps us to be less judgmental of others and the decisions and actions that they take because we can look at them and say, yeah, some of the things that they do, we wouldn't do. And we cannot necessarily understand why they have made the decisions that they've made or taken the actions that they've taken. But if we understand that they're sinful in nature and they might not be connected with God, then it helps us understand where they're coming from, what they are doing, and why they act how they act. And instead of being judgmental to those people, maybe we can look at them with an eye that says they need help. We should give them help rather than dismiss them and put them in a corner. Psalm 38 verses 17 to 18 says this, and this is from David. I am about to fall and my pain is ever with me. I confess my iniquity. I am troubled by my sin. And here David is looking and seeing the sin that is within him. The pain that comes from acting on our sin. The pain that comes from feeling temptation and acting on temptation and the lack of peace of mind that comes from being troubled by the sinful thoughts, the sinful nature that we experience in life. Sin is in us. Sin, especially when hidden, it occupies our thoughts. It troubles us. We think about it. We can obsess about it. We can worry about it. We know something that's not right and our spirit wills us to make things right and to confess our sin and to deal with our sin so that we can make things right. Job 12.22 says this, He reveals the deep things of darkness and brings deep shadows into the light. God knows what is bad for us. 
He knows what we feel, but he doesn't want that for us. He doesn't want bad things for us. He knows that bringing our sins into the light, while it might be painful at the time we do it, we might feel dirty, we might feel wrong, because we are confess confessing the things that we are naturally wanting to keep hidden. But God knows that ultimately that leads to better things for us. So we should surrender to God, not to our sin, but surrender to God. And Isaiah 64 verse 8 puts it like this. Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay and you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. You know, we are not robots. And that's not what this verse is saying. As Heather said in one of, one of the um, messages during the week, God doesn't want us to be robots. But we do need to acknowledge that he is Father. He is the potter and we are the clay. And surrendering to him doesn't make us robots or automatons. What it does, it's like saying, we are the child and you are the father. And the father knows what is best for the child. And the child does well to follow what the father suggests the, the child should do. So how does confession and surrender lead to prayer? Well, when we feel wrong, we quite often feel a need to withdraw and separate ourselves from God rather than actually bring ourselves to God because we can feel unworthy, we can feel, oh, I've done something wrong, I've blown my relationship with God. That's not the truth. That's not the case. That's what Satan wants us to believe in those times. But confession and surrender is about talking to God, getting closer to God, drawing near to God. And we can do that through prayer. We want to remove that secret burden that we cling to, that makes us feel wrong. We want to surrender to God, be held and comforted by him. Just as a child, when they've done something wrong, they want their parent to hug them and say, no, you're still good. We still love you. You're still loved. Look at how children run to their parents. And all they want is, it will be okay. They want to know what they need to do. And God tells us, lets us know that it will be okay and what we need to do. And prayer gets us talking to God. The more focused we can be in our prayer to God, the more we can hear from him. And we'll look at what that is in part two.
your fault Steal your love far from me You have been so, so good to me When I felt no worse You paid it all for me You have been so, so kind to me
So we've been looking at how we can get closer to God, how we can deal with sin, what sin makes us feel, and how getting closer to God counteracts what sin makes us feel. But we've said get closer to God through prayer. So how does that reflect in ourselves? So what we can do through prayer is reflection on ourselves and then get closer to God. But also it aids our self-control. And there's something else that we can do to help all of that. And that is fasting. So how carefully do you monitor the things that go into your mouth? Now, sometimes people don't monitor that at all, but sometimes people are very, very careful about the things that go into their mouth. So they might think about things like a low fat diet so that they don't eat too much fat and grow fat, like many of us maybe have been doing through lockdown, for example. You might track the grams of fat that goes into your body. Some people wear food or they look religiously almost at the labels that are on food. They might watch the number of calories. So how much calories do you consume versus how much calories do you burn? They might limit the amount of caffeine that goes into them so they don't feel nervous and get shakes and things like that. They might look at how their food is produced or farmed. So for example, they might eat dolphin friendly tuna. They might look at how far away their food is sourced. So they might be what we call a locavore. And what that, what that person does is they look at the, the number of food miles that food actually has traveled before it gets to their plate. They might be a vegetarian or a vegan and, and not want any harm to come to animals at all to the, the food that they eat. They might only eat free range chickens. Now we've got chickens in our garden and obviously they get to roam around. Although again, not recently because they too are in lockdown due to bird flu. And hopefully when we come out of lockdown, it'll be warm enough that they too can come out of lockdown as well. But people might only specifically eat free range chickens rather than, sorry, free range chickens or free range eggs rather than caged bird eggs. They might eat organic foods, so no pesticides or anything like that, which has affected the land. So we might be very keen to look and monitor and be careful about the things that come into our mouths and into our bodies. Now, their value, to be honest, might well be limited. You know, they may make us a healthier body. Um, they might well make us a little poorer because quite often these things cost more, but their value is temporary. You know, once you've consumed that, it is the next meal that is important. And you have to make sure again, that whatever value you had on the last thing that you put in your mouth now has to transpose again to the next thing that you put in your mouth. But compare that to the care you take in controlling what goes into your mouth with how careful you are to control what comes out of your mouth. So how carefully do you monitor what comes out of your mouth? Do you apply as much thought, control and energy and planning on the speech that you apply to controlling your calories or your fat grams or your carbohydrates? And if not, then you're focusing on the wrong thing. You're making sure that your body is good, but you're not making sure that your mind and your spirit is good. Because Jesus says that what comes out of your mouth can defile you. It can make you bad, which means we need to look at self-control. Now, let's think about self-control and some aspects of it. Uh, can you be led around by your feelings? And whatever you're feeling at that time, you let the world know because everybody deserves to know how you feel. And whether you're feeling bad, whether you're feeling good, that's how you will treat people. Maybe you're out of control in your spending and you think, well, you know, I'm, all I'm doing is I deserve a treat. 
you know um, th that is something that I can suffer from you know um, just this week another book arrived at the house after I told Nick I'm not gonna buy any more books and another book arrived and she sat there waiting for the next toy to arrive as well maybe you're out of control in your attitude and this can be really damaging you know where you you think I'm in a bad mood and I'm not going to do anything to try and control that attitude maybe you're out of control in the use of your time and you just sit binge watching TV or surfing the internet rather than doing something productive or maybe you're out of control of your emotions and whatever you're feeling there and then that will be the defining thing of how you will actually react to any given situation and how you react to it today and how you react to it tomorrow depends on what your emotional state is at that time you get upset at everything and you're always in a major crisis you know Galatians 5 verse 23 talks about the fruit of the spirit and it says gentleness and self-control are parts of the fruit of the spirit as we get closer to God the fruit of the spirit will be gentleness and self-control and self-control means getting a grip or taking hold of these types of things that we have 1 Corinthians 9 verses 25 says this everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things they then do it to receive a perishable wreath but we are imperishable you know it's talking there about how athletes practice and exercise self-control in all things so that they can win the games you know if you're competing in the Olympic Games they will weigh out their food they will do lots of the things that we talked about earlier weigh their food exercise train and train and train they will spend hours a day training to be at their peak proficiency their peak performance ready for those games so that they can win a wreath at that time a medal in modern times but those things look you know they're perishable we are imperishable we when we die we will live forever either in heaven or in hell and what we do here determines that you know are we going to accept that Christ died on that cross for us and live in heaven or are we going to reject that Christ died off for us on that cross and live in hell but as part of that we then need to look at the fruit of the Spirit as we accept Christ and get closer to Christ and let the fruit of the Spirit well up in us and bring us to a place where we are more of what the Spirit wants us to be and part of that is gentleness and self-control so if we think about what we do in the natural to better ourselves suppose we want to you know improve our physicalness we will exercise and that will build muscle and we develop that muscle and it grows but exercising a muscle hurts you know when you keep doing something when you lift weights when, when you start off, it hurts. When you run to get fit, it will hurt until your body gets used to doing what it is now having to do. And when we get closer to God, it will initially hurt. As we confess sin, as, we, as I said earlier, it can initially hurt, but it will be ultimately leading to a better place. We become more interested in pleasing God than we are in pleasing ourselves. And areas where, that we have where we are undisciplined are going to keep us back from experiencing God's best. So we need to look at those undisciplined areas and exercise in them, get closer to God in them, deal with them so that we can get closer to God and learn to live for his pleasure which will ultimately bring pleasure to us as well because we are more aligned in the things that please God what brings God pleasure will bring us 
pleasure. Hebrews 12 verse 11 says this, No discipline is enjoyable whilst it is happening. It's painful. But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. We have to start thinking about later on. Decisions today determine where we are going to be later on. If all we think about is the now, if all we think about is today, we will never start to make plans about where do we want to be and where do you want to be in the future? You know, do you want to be repeating the same sort of day that you are having now? The same sort of day that you've been having over the past year or so? Or do you want to have a different day, a better day? Because if that is the case, you need to plan. You need to decide what sort of day you want to have in the future. And you need to start to plan now and you need to move now into the place that will enable you to have that better day. You know, whether that is looking at your finances and saying, I am not going to spend tomorrow what I spent today. I'm going to look at things differently. Maybe it's looking at relationships and saying, I am not going to treat people tomorrow how I treated people today. And then think about what you need to do to do that. I'm not going to react in the same situation how I reacted today in the future. In the future, I will react better. What do I need to do? But a lot of that can be helped by drawing closer to God. But you will have the pain of discipline during that. But that pain of discipline, it weighs ounces, you know, compared to the pain of regret, which weighs tons. The pain of discipline lasts a short while until you see the benefits and those benefits help that pain go away. The pain of regret doesn't go away and it weighs on you and drags you into the ground. Undisciplined areas do not change. And unless you start to discipline yourself, you will never change those undisciplined areas in your life. Galatians 5.25 says this, If we live by the Holy Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. If by the Holy Spirit we have our life in God, let us go forward walking in line, our conduct controlled by the Spirit. It takes time to develop new good habits. They're not going to come over night. And you may, along the way, stumble and make mistakes. Don't throw away all the progress that you may have made because you made one mistake. Go back and get back on that and continue to discipline yourself and learn from that, that mistake that happened. You can change. People change. It's difficult to do it alone, but with the Holy Spirit, it can help you. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 12 says this, Everything is permissible, allowed and lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. They may be good for me or expedient and profitable when considered with other things. Everything is lawful for me. But I will not become the slave of anything or be bought under its power. Do you know, everything is permissible and it is. You know, you can do pretty much anything you want. Okay, you can't kill people. That's not. But you're allowed to go out. You're allowed to drink what you want. You're allowed to smoke. You're allowed to eat unhealthily. You're allowed to spend what you want. I am as well. We are all allowed to do those things. But as it says here in the scriptures, it might not be helpful to you. It might not be good for me to do this. It might be not be expedient and profitable when considered with other things. And there might be a price to pay for doing those things. I can do them. I'm allowed to do them. But is it the best for me? Is it what God wants for me. In order to go higher, 
Our flesh has to go lower. We have to put God above ourselves. And we have to put ourselves lower than God. Our self-desires. Self-control doesn't mean our feelings are going to go away. We're still going to feel those things. We're still going to desire those things. But self-control says, I understand that those things are not what is good for me. And therefore, I'm going to put them on one side. Now, this isn't God being a killjoy because those things are there. And, you know, God has created so much stuff for our pleasure. But what we do is, and we, what we allow Satan to do, is to take the things that God has given us for pleasure and corrupt them. And we think we're experiencing pleasure. But afterwards, we're experiencing regret and guilt. And it's anything but pleasure afterwards. But God says, if you actually experience these pleasurable things within the, the areas that I have created them for, then the pleasure will remain and it will grow bigger and bigger and bigger. And you will have a far more fulfilled life than if you just willy-nilly go for your desires. Mark chapter 8 verse 34 says this, Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. A disciple equals somebody with discipline. So in what areas do you need to be more disciplined? Your friends, the people you hang around with, how you act with them, your thought life, what you think, how you feel about other people, whether you feel jealousy of what other people do, have, whether what, what you are reading and bringing into your thoughts, whether you're watching and bringing into your thoughts, so your thoughts are getting corrupted. The conversations that you have, the conversations that you're drawn to, gossip, are you looking at gossip and going, oh yeah, that's a bit juicy, let's find a bit more about that. These things are all not the best for us. How we spend our time, how much time do we spend on social media? How much time do we spend just looking up other things on YouTube or whatever? It can be good. It can certainly be good to watch certain things. You know, as I said, every week it is every every week day for the next couple of weeks. Watch our communion service at 7:30 each night. That's good. That's profitable time. But is watching cats fall off a shelf? profitable time if we keep watching just millions of videos of cats falling off a shelf friends finances how we spend our money what we spend our money on how we look after our money and what that means for our long-term financial stability so let's think about reflection and self-control and how does fasting get into this so fasting these types of things that we need to think about that might not be good for us helps us draw away from those things and draw closer to God and we're going to look a lot more of this next week we're going to look at different types of fasting and how you can fast but here are some verses for you to look up during the week you know the, the scriptures teach us to fast and to pray and you can look at Matthew 6 verses 17 to 18 to look at that. Fasting and prayer put us in the best possible position for a breakthrough with God. And Judges chapter 20 verses 26 speaks about that. Now, we can abstain from food to regain mastery of the flesh. What does that mean? Well, Matthew 4 verse 4 says this. Man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So by removing food for a period of time and using that time to focus on God, we can start to draw closer to God and understand and listen and hear what God is saying to us. You know, Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve eat the apple, that apple diverted their attention away from God and it allowed temptations towards false beliefs 
to take control of everything that they did. Now next week we're going to go deeper into, as I said, the different forms of fasting. And we're going to also look at the act of giving through, you know, as an act of mourning. So it'll be great to see you next week. But for now, let's pause.
It's been great to spend time with you this morning and we hope that you've got an awful lot out of this and it's helping you to understand the importance of Lent and that it's not just a ritual, it's not just something that we do each year because you know it's there. It is designed to reflect Jesus going into the wilderness and spending 40 days to get closer to God and it helps us think about the things that maybe aren't best for us, that might bring, bring us apart from God and giving some of that up so that we can get closer to God. So it's been really good to have you here. Please remember to watch the daily devotionals, the Paper Pilgrimage that will, is on each night at 7.30. And we just hope that you're getting a fantastic experience out of that, virtually taking communion together at the same time. I know that we've been absolutely loving it so far. So have a fantastic week, and I'm just gonna close in prayer. Father, we thank you that you are there for us. And we might do things that mean that we don't necessarily appreciate that you are there for us and just how much you're there for us. That you have set our lives up for them lives to be the best. And we can often confuse following you, you being the potter, us being the, the clay. We can often confuse that with meaning that we have no free will and we are robots. But that's not what you've designed us for. You've designed us to willingly want to come to you and see that the path that you have laid out for us is the best path for us. That you have created things for our pleasure that Satan has corrupted, that Satan has taken and made bad and that we sometimes fall into the traps that Satan has laid for us, that divert us from the path or corrupt the pleasure that you've given us. Father, I just pray for everybody watching this morning that they can spend time through Lent, through the services that we have daily, getting closer to you, beginning to look at their lives and look at things that started out good but may have been a bit corrupted and that they, during that time that they are spending time with you, they can reevaluate and reset those things in their life and bring them to a point where they bring, you, bring them to you and set their lives on that straight path that you have laid for us. Amen. Have a fantastic week. We'd love to hear comments from you, but have a great week. Goodbye. Thank you.